Recording in progress.
Welcome to the United Church of the Valley, a progressive Christian community. And let me interject in here. We've all heard something for the last three weeks. All are welcome here. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are from, what your religion is, or what your color is. All are welcome here. In the United States, we believe following the path and teachings of Jesus can lead to an experience of the sacred and the oneness and unity of life. And we also affirm that the teachings of Jesus provides one of many ways to experience the sacred. We can draw from the divorce sources of wisdom on our spiritual journey. So whether you are on your journey, you are welcome here. We know that the way we behave towards one another is the fullest expression of what we believe. We welcome you who are here in the building and welcome to you who are here who are journeying online. Gotcha. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Will you join with me in the call to presence? When I think of God's presence in the world, I am grateful. When I think of God's presence in my life, I am humbled. When I think of God's presence in this community, I am glad. glad to be Thank you all. Thank you, God. All right. We have um, a song that I have to convert the French Princess. It's new to me, but I understand it's not new to a lot of the other people. So it's going to be the Texas Supreme coming up to help us help you. Mm -hmm.
hate when you share a theme of worship and then it just, like, I'm preaching this, and then you come and everything falls in the line in place. Oh, it's like we've been doing this for a while. Um, I invite you to hear this words of scripture from John's story, starting at verse 15. And if you'll remember a couple weeks ago when I was here, I read the beginning at uh, chapter 14. Um, and so this is sort of continuing on uh, Jesus' final discourse where he's, you know, got his short time with syndrome. He's got all these things he wants to share. So in, I invite you to hear these words of scripture from chapter 14 in John's story, beginning at verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. However, you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, and then the living out of these words be wholly acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Um, it's the end of the school year. Praise God. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of reflecting, and I started doing some math of how long I've been teaching and how long I've been in ministry. And this October will mark 25 years since I started my ministry. Wow. Yeah, I know. I don't look that old. <laughs> uh, and honestly, it just makes me feel old. <laughs> because I've been doing this for 25 years now. Um, but I've also been attending church because it was like when I was seven that my, my dad decided that we needed to start going to church regularly. My this is a whole other story. My parents met at um, Crystal Cathedral. Remember the Crystal Cathedral in Orange County? They met at the Crystal Cathedral. And back in those days, there's a Crystal Cathedral on one side, and then there's this major thoroughfare, if you know anything about Orange County, Garden Grove Boulevard. And then the Sunday school room was the building across the street that's now Kaiser, and there was a bridge. And as I became a parent, I thought to myself, I don't think I would ever walk across a bridge like that be that far from my children in a glass building in Southern California on the other side of a major thoroughfare. But that has nothing to do with my sermon, but I'm just reflecting back. <laughs> but for 40 years, I've been going to church pretty regularly, and I was that weird kid who didn't want, we were in this big church, and there was Sunday school for every single grade and every single age. And I was that weird kid when I was about um, probably nine, my Sunday school teacher just went up to my parents and was like, she kind of asks a lot of questions, and we can't do all the crafts, and we can't do all the things. So um, at nine, I just I really wanted to be in church. And so at nine, starting about age nine, I sat in worship with my parents. I was the only nine-year-old um, who did that. And so over that amount of time, I've heard a lot of sermons. I've preached a lot of sermons. I've heard a lot of sermons. And if you're anywhere in the church, you know that you're going to hear a lot of sermons about love, right? I remember m the last sermon that my childhood pastor preached. He was our pastor for like 17 years. And when he retired, I left from, you know, came back from college just to be there. And his sermon title is, You Can't Retire from Love. And I thought that was really profound, right? And then, um, and he reflected on his life in ministry and preached about how retiring from ministry wasn't like retiring from the work of being love and doing these commandments, right? And then my dad and stepmom on their however many marriages they were on, sorry, I shouldn't say that, but it's true. They got married in worship. It was part of the worship service. And um, that same pastor who preached that sermon, he 
Um, his sermon title was Make Love, which I was like, ooh, that feels a little risque for church, right? So that's always stuck with me, but he talked just about how love is an action and not as a Hallmark card or an emotion. I've heard clergy confess on their retirement gatherings about how they're still learning to love, right? And I think that we're all still learning and growing and figuring out what that actually means like in our relationships with our children and in our world and with our planet, right? I've preached and heard so many sermons on love, the vast, the limitless love of God. Um, one of my favorite sermons I heard in Nashville quite a few years ago at a preaching conference by Lauren Weiner. if you've ever had a chance to read any of her books. She talks about um, spirituality and practicing being church rather than um, being spiritual. And she talked about, you know, how that we hear at weddings a lot, the love passage, right? Love is, um, love is patient and kind and not envious or boastful, arrogant and rude. And, and she just confessed, I've been in ministry a long time. Um, I've, I've been in, in church a long time and that she just said, I, I haven't, I don't know that I've necessarily seen that kind of love embodied. And so she rewrote the scripture, and I, and I love this retelling. Christ is patient. Christ is kind. Christ is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Christ doesn't insist on his own way. Christ is not irritable or resentful, although there were some moments in the Gospels he was. Christ does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rather rejoices in the truth. Christ bore all things on our behalf hopes all things, believes all things, has endured all things. And I love that take on the text of that very familiar um, scripture. But the truth is the church isn't the only one that's obsessed with love, right? That has something to say about love. Our country is obsessed with love. In fact, I did a Google search about love and there's over 7 billion hits. <laughs> Man, imagine how long that would take you to go through all of that. Over 83 million, if you're still looking, are about finding love. 10 million have to do with finding true love, because who wants just love? You want true love, right? And the fact, uh, the fact there was a third website that comes up on Google, it's called the Love Calculator, which will actually calculate your chances of how to be in a successful relationship. So in case you're also looking, um, check that out. Our country is obsessed with love, right? There's 3,000 songs in this past century that have it in the title. Over 125 were top hits. There are 1,000 movies that have love in the title. Dozens of songs in our hymnals and in our church music. I mean, I think we have at least three today, right? I think one of the things, though, about the word love is it's so overused, right? I continually hear about people talking about clothes and purses and watches and cars and, oh, I just love them. And I think, can you really love an innate object the same way that you love your person, your partner, your kid, your neighbor? I always think there has to be a better word for things like that, right? I deeply like my watch. Sometimes I think we use the word love like it's going out of style. Our lives are saturated with the concept of love, but I think if we're honest, <laughs> we're still trying to figure out how to love and embody that love, right? And then today's scripture, Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And so my question to Jesus is, which one? There's so many. When I was in high school, we had a tradition that every graduating class would do something special to leave sort of their mark, their legacy on the campus. Anybody have that happen at their, at their school that they went to? I remember the year before um, my graduating class, I won't tell you what year that is. Um, the year before my graduating class, they painted a wall with a, a beautiful mural that they had like commissioned with some um, words of wisdom. And then they put at the bottom, you know, class of back in the 1900s sometimes. Um, some classes would uh, plant a tree, right, which I thought was a beautiful symbol to have beauty on our campus. Our class, we raised money, um, and we put some 
uh, benches. We didn't have enough benches in our in the middle of our quad, and we had like um, words of kindness, like say to yourself, "You're beautiful, you're kind, you're smart." Um, on those, it was a tradition, and really the tradition was about leaving a mark, right? Having a legacy to re be remembered by. And today, that's what Jesus is doing, right? In this scripture, what's his legacy? What's Jesus's legacy? Well, he says, if you, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And then guess what? They'll know me through you in the way that you have kept my commandments. This text in John 14 is part of his farewell discourse. It's his short timer syndrome. It's him wanting to get all of these extra words out, all of these things. If I haven't been clear up to now, just take note in this, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. Which commandment? Which one is he referring to? Early in the gospel, in John's gospel, he tells his disciples that the new commandment is to love one another as he has loved them. And then what does that look like? Do you remember he got on his knees and he touched some dirty feet? And he washed them. And it was selfless. And it was dirty. But it was his act of love to say, if you love me, keep my commandments. And here's actually what it's going to look like. Throughout the New Testament, we encounter so many definitions and descriptions of what Love is. Some mysterious, others a little bit more concrete. We know that God is love, and we're given that example in the person and even more, the actions of Jesus himself. In Leviticus, it tells us that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. What Jesus claiming as the greatest second commandment, love God as the first Yet Jesus' statement, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, it doesn't specify any of all of these commandments. It only implies that if we love Jesus, we're to love one another and to keep that commandment. In this text, we learn a little bit more about what that means. He talks about an advocate as part of the legacy. I'm not going to leave you alone. I am going to give you the strength the power, the spirit within you to be able to do that. Because sometimes that love is messy. Sometimes that love is hard. And sometimes that love is ugly almost. Out of Jesus' love for his followers and the love for Jesus and humanity, an advocate, a helper, as it's translated in the Greek, an advocate is a helper, is someone who's going to give us the strength to be able to live out those commandments. So here, in this text, to love is to be an advocate. Let me say that again. In this text, to love is to be an advocate, to give oneself of others as Jesus gave himself to his disciples and to those he encountered. We see Jesus loving advocating in his ministry with the poor, with the marginalized, with women, with persons of differing, differing abilities, with strangers, and with the imprisoned. He fell, fed the hungry, he healed the sick. The list goes on, but all the while advocating for those that others had left behind. These are the parts of his legacy. This is the commandment in which he's calling us to live out. We are to continue loving our neighbor and seeing them as God sees each of us in word and in deed. The spirit is still moving among and within us today as we work toward that love and living out those commandments. But the important thing to remember is we haven't been left alone in the task to follow the commandment. 
And that love, it's going to look like the love that Jesus lived. It's a love that's sacrificed. It's a love that sometimes shocks even the best and well of intentioned people. It's a love that gives. It's a love that's open to change. Let me say that again. It's a love that's open to change. It's a love that's expensive, that's intentional, that pushes us to our very limits. It's a love that includes and accepts and it's generous and it stretches us to be all that God intends us to be. Selfish love gets in the way because sometimes we like things the way they are. We like to be comfortable, we like to be predictable, we like life to be easy. We definitely, well some of us, don't like to draw attention to ourselves. But sometimes we have to be reminded of what's most important and that's when we have to be courageous enough to open our hearts to those things and follow that commandment as we're advocating. And that's what it means to keep that commandment. May it be so. Amen. At the United Church of the Valley, we seek to be inclusive of all people. We strive for peace and justice among all people. We strive to protect and restore the integrity of our earth. We commit to a path of lifelong learning, compassion, and love. And we invite you to be part of this mission and we thank you for your generosity. There is a collection plate on the organ for those who are here in person. And of course, all of us can make a donation by going to our website, ucbchurch.org, where you can make use of either Vimo or PayPal. And of course, you can always mail checks to our mailing address, P.O. Box 1312, Marietta, California. 92564. A beloved community, in a beloved community, people care about one another and share their joys and sorrows and concerns. And keeping abreast of what's going on in each other's lives, help us know that we are truly part of a beloved community. And every week we share the joys and concerns of our community through email, so we can all share them together today. And they will be shown on the screen as I read them aloud. And after each joy or concern, I will say, together we pray, and we will respond together, hear us, O oh God. Concern from Sharon Graff. The pastor of one of our sibling congregations, Redlands UCC, is the Reverend Dr. Jill Kirshner Ro Rose. Her cancer treatments are no longer effective, and she has entered hospice care. Pray, please, for Jill, her wife, Karen, and their da young daughter, Danielle, and for the congregation of Redlands UCC. Christy Ash, no, that's it. Together we pray. Sure. Christy Clinton asked for prayers for her safe travel to Kansas and Tennessee, for her family while she is gone, and a joyful reunion with a family that she hasn't seen in several years, eight years. Together we pray. Sure. Prayers for the comfort of Rachel Dennis's friend, Megan, who recently lost her mother. Together we pray. 
prayer for the folks that are exploring the reestablishment of Emily's house. The need is great for a safe place for our LGBT youth, young adults, friends, families, and allies. Together we pray. Are there any other joys or concerns? One of my friends is a band kid, but she is going to high school this year. Uh, like she's gonna graduate, and all of us are planning like when we we will get together hopefully because she we might not be able to see her the, as much as we are now. So we're all gonna miss her, and we're gonna miss the mini ensemble ensemble we have created. We she's a clarinet player like. Isabel, and we're just praying for her that she will enjoy, um, what's it called, high school, and um, what's it called, enjoy the drum line because she couldn't join marching band, but we're wishing her the best of luck, and we're really going to miss her, so, yeah. Thank you. More? You want to be praying? Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Sky and Doug and <laughs> Rachel, who isn't here. These are folks who have just recently been coming to UCB on a regular basis, and I was really moved by the fact that they actually volunteered to help us set up this morning to be our greeters, um, and I just wanted to say thank you. And second of all, I would like to, I got a text message from Rachel while I was coming in this morning. And she was going to be doing setup and getting us ready for a service. And um, needless to say, she was not in very good shape. She just found out that one of her very dearest friends had just been killed in an automobile accident. And she was um, devastated. So I would like to offer up prayers um, for Rachel and that she... Um, that she finds some comfort and peace. Together we pray. Any more? Yes, we have over here. So the, the joy in our house is that we're no longer contagious from COVID that we've been fighting the last three weeks. Um, and the prayer concern is that my husband and son are still really tired, having some coughing, having, having some symptoms that are interfering with uh, them just getting on. So it comes and goes. <laughs> Together we pray. Well, I have a, a couple of phrases. It's great to be here again uh, with you all. It's been a long time. Um, I had a new work schedule to adapt to, and it's challenging, but it's fulfilling. And uh, I can also, I'm excited because uh, right around July 2nd, I'll be, um, it'll be like a hallmark moment, very tearful probably as my wife and my kids finally <laughs> are flying <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so yes, they'll be here in July. And uh, it's just been kind of a, it's been really also kind of a challenge to get everything um, just ready for them to, um, uh, just ready for the kids to go to school, you know, everything to be there for my wife to um, just adjust to living once again in this country. She's coming from Tokyo. So um, thank you very much for all your support. And it's great to be here. I hope to hopefully that um, in a few weeks you'll get to meet all of them as well. So great. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Together we pray. I'll go. I'm Helen. <laughs> well, I'm Helen. I don't know you. I um, just wanted to, um, I guess, to just a, a joy that I have in my heart is that I've been kind of watching television with our, our young teenagers, and there is so much diversity um, in the shows that they have now that we didn't experience as, as kids. So just, just a joy in the change in our society. Any others? I have a joy. 
tomorrow I'm finally going to get some glasses <laughs> so I can see all of you and take care of this eye that has been bugging me for weeks. That's my joy. I hope I will be able to see all of you clearly. Okay, is that it? Let us share together in a moment of holy silence. No matter how we understand prayer, we find that it is good to pray. And together we hold the names and words spoken and unspoken, a spirit of concern, a spirit of joy, a spirit of connection, and now a spirit of prayer. O oh, great love, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. And may all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and all beings. Help us become a community that vulnerability shares each other's burdens. Listen to our heart's longings for the healing of our world. We offer these prayers in all the holy names of God. We pray together in one voice the prayer the disciples taught us disciples. First, the common version that connects us to our grandparents and great-grandparents. And then let us pray together another version that speaks to many of our longings and understanding today. Our God, part in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from our time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Loving Spirit, who is in heaven and within us, we call upon your names. Your wisdom come, your will be done in all the spaces in which you dwell. Give us each day sustenance and perseverance. Remind us of our limits as we give grace to the limits of others and separate us from the temptation of empire. But deliver us into your community. For you are the dwelling place within us, the empowerment around us, and the celebration among us now and forever. Amen. Now is the time that we pass the peace as an act of forgiveness and reconciliation. Jesus told his disciples that before they come to be reconciled with God, they should first reconcile with one another. And so during this time of sharing Christ's peace, we are encouraged to seek and to offer forgiveness. And when we turn to those around us with a greeting, may the peace of Christ be with you and respond and also with you, we symbolize our unity even in the midst of divisions. And when we pass the peace, we practice God's call to make every effort to maintain the bond of peace. Let us wave our peace to each other. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. we come together to share together in this meal we're reminded that this is God's table that all are welcome that no one is excluded that all are invited and every time we partake in this meal we do this in remembrance of the love of Jesus I wanted to read this scripture to you this was my uh, scripture that I held on to for a very long time 
uh, when I was doing youth ministry, this was painted on the wall, uh, and it fits in with which of our commandments. It's 1 John 4, um, 12. It says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. And so as we think about our commandments that we're following, think about that how it's when people see the way that we love, that that's how they know God. It's a little powerful, but also a little intimidating at the same time. As we come together this day, we remember that on the last time that Jesus shared a meal with his disciples, he took bread, he gave thanks to God, he blessed it, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my life, this is my body which is broken for you. Every time I eat it, do it in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to God, he blessed it, he poured it out for his disciples, and he shared it around the tables and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my cup of abundant love and abundant grace poured out for you and for many for all time. Every time you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. Will you join with me in prayer? Pour out your spirit, O oh God, on these gifts of bread and juice for us. Make them be for us the bread of life and the cup of your grace and love, that it may strengthen us for the work ahead as we go out from this place and live your commandments and love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. bread of life and the cup of God's grace broken and poured out for us. you join with me in the prayer after communion? Holy God, we have eaten the bread and drunk the wine. We have been touched by your spirit and are thankful. Still speaking, God, as we go from this place to be the church in the world, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit be our guide and strength today and in the days to come. Amen. All right, choir, come on up. All right. <laughs> Please end this day without singing the song. You guys have to help. <laughs> 